it's quite clear that many Britons regret the decision they made last year. And I probably would change my vote, if, if I'm honest. Off camera, there are those who say they now regret their vote to leave the EU. I do regret voting at all. I wish I'd just stayed right out of it. In December 2022, based on a study of YouGov, more than 50% of the UK population said it has been wrong for Great Britain to withdraw from the European Union. This withdrawal, commonly called Brexit, is a portmanteau of Britain and Exit. It has had a profound impact on the economic and social landscape of the UK, leading to significant changes that have disrupted many aspects of Britain's life and identity. In this video, we're going to look at why Brexit happened, its influence on the economy, and effect on the separation in the country. This is a surreal Brexit. Back in 1958, the precursor of the European Union, European Economic Community, was established by six nations without Great Britain. In 1972, to resolve the economic stagnation, the UK officially joined the EEC. But at the same time, there had been always discord between the community and the UK. In 1992, EEC made a groundbreaking deal, Treaty of Maastricht. This treaty was enacted to implement the following two policies, a single currency, aka Euro, and political integration, including common foreign and security policies. EEC was reformed into the European Union with its treaty, and the UK Prime Minister John Major signed this agreement. However, he was not in favour of the introduction of the Euro and the EU giving them opt-outs with the right to decide if and when they would join their currency. These discrepancies between the nation and the Union led English Conservatives to become dubious about the whole EU. And in 1993, UK Independence Party UKIP was established to make Great Britain leave the European Union, and it gradually gained support by absorbing anti-EU forces in the UK. Assignment by in 2010's UKIP kept expanding its power. Around this time, the terrorist attack in London in 2005 and the refugee crisis of the Syrian civil war became huge problems. However, the majority of the EU member states, including the UK, were unable to cope with these issues immediately because the member states' decision rights were delegated to the Union. Many British citizens began turning their eyes to the EU's disadvantages more than their benefits. UK agitated people's negativity toward the EU by constantly exaggerating the Union's issue. In 2014, UK won a landslide victory in the European Parliament election, where British citizens chose which party represent the UK in the EU, defeating both Labour and Conservative parties. The rise of UK made Brexit a major topic in 2015's UK general election. Meanwhile, prior to the election, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, and the head of the Conservative Party delivered a speech and promised the following policy. Should the Conservatism win at the 2015 general election, the British government would negotiate more favourable agreements for continuing membership of the EU. And at the same time, they would hold a referendum on whether the UK should remain in or leave the Union. Now, what they envisaged was using pressure from the anti-EU faction of the Conservative Party to put various demands on the European Union. And at the same time, in order to keep the anti-EU faction stop growing, he set up a referendum where he expected the result of the Remain vote would exceed that of the Leave. I am in favour of having a referendum. In this election, the Conservatives won the victory, and as promised in the election manifesto, the referendum took place on the 23rd June 2016. 51% of the population voted to Leave, and 48 voted to Remain a result that Cameron was not expected. This political manifesto of his was nothing but risky gambling. Cameron left everything about the fate of the country to the people without telling them about the possible effect of Brexit. He did not take English people's negativity toward the EU into account and sacrifice the fate of the nation for his own political life. The worst political decision one can imagine. After the referendum, Cameron resigned as the Prime Minister and the Conservatives elected Theresa May as his successor. Her main goal was to pass a draft of the Brexit withdrawal agreement in the British Parliament before handing the whole plan to the EU. Based on this agreement, the European Union allows Britain to leave the Union, but without this, it will be no deal Brexit. In this draft, in terms of tariff, she stated that the UK would stay in the EU custom union for the time being, which was a compromise proposal incorporating the ideas of pro- and anti-EU factions. However, this draft got rejected by the House of Commons of the British Parliament three times. Because based on a draft agreement, the UK would continue to be bound by EU rules and won't be able to decide its own rules of tariffs. May failed to pass a draft in Parliament, 
and as no confidence motion of her was passed, she resigned from the post of Prime Minister and the head of the Conservative Party. After that, Boris Johnson became her successor in July. Johnson heavily modifies May's draft, and he stated that apart from Northern Ireland, the UK would completely leave the non-tariff barrier of the EU. On the 22nd of October 2019, the draft of agreement was officially passed in the House of Commons for the first time. After the details of agreement were approved by the British government, on January 31st, the UK officially left the European Union. So, what happened next? According to the OECD, GDP growth between 2019 and 2022 increased in most G7 countries, while only the UK saw a decline. The pandemic and the Ukrainian war are partially responsible for this issue, but the loot of the weakened economy actually stems some Brexit. So, what went wrong? As a member of the EU single market, the EU countries can ship items to other EU nations without paying tariffs and with no need for custom inspections. When the UK was one of the EU nations, Great Britain played a role as a gateway for many international companies to the European Union, the world's largest market. Even though the demand of the UK itself is small, a company could ship and import items to and from the rest of the nations of the European Union very easily. But after Brexit, the UK became a country outside the European Union which means that the most of shipment to and from Great Britain is now required to pay the tariff and spend time for inspection at custom checkpoints. This has been a significant adverse impact on trade, especially the issue of tariffs. In a press conference on December 25th, Boris Johnson stated as follows. Uh, that we have completed the biggest trade deal yet, worth £660 billion a year, a comprehensive Canada-style free trade deal between the UK and the EU. The new free trade agreement with the EU provides for zero tariffs and zero costs on all goods as long as they comply with appropriate rules of origin. This crucial fact, rules of origin, is actually the elephant in the room. Let me explain this rule in the simplest way. Japan, for example, has a free trade agreement with the EU. Under the rules of origin, if Japan ships an automobile to the EU as a free trade, the product must be sold and built in Japan at a certain ratio, which is basically set to more than 60%. But in most cases, less than 40% of the parts are built in Japan, and the rest is built by other nations, for instance, 30% in Vietnam and another 30% in Cambodia. In this case, the cumulation rule will be applied. The truth is, Vietnam and the EU have a free trade agreement, and Japan and Vietnam have the same treaty as well. This means that the items made in Vietnam can be accumulated in the rules of origin, and Japan can ship the car to the EU market with no tariff. But they can't apply the same rule to the Cambodian built parts, because the nation has a free trade agreement with neither the EU nor Japan. Now, back to the new free trade agreement between the UK and the EU, the European Union set two fundamental rules. 1. UK produced products shipping to the EU now have to clarify the rules of origin. 2. Cumulation rule will be only applied to either UK or EU origin products. This means that for instance, if more than 60% of the parts of the automobile are built by either British or EU nations, there is no need to pay a tariff. But if the number consists of other nations' products, such as Japan or Vietnam, the accumulation rule will be not be applied and paying tariff will be required. Even if products are made in countries that have a free trade agreement with the EU, it is not cumulative for UK origin products. Mike Hoss, chief executive of the UK Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, once mentioned the issue of the rules of origin. Quote, to move from where we currently are, let us say 20% to 25% originating content, to 60% will take many years. There is not necessarily the capability here in the UK. On a service level, the government expresses the non-tariff merit of the new free trade agreement with the EU. But in reality, the non-tariff can be applied only in limited cases. Mostly due to new tariffs, moving cross-channel freight costs now increased by 47% in January 2021 compared with the same period in 2020. Speaking of the cross-channel, custom inspection is also a problem. In the port of Dover, Kent, countless trucks are now always waiting hours before they cross the thread of Dover for the sake of custom inspections and quarantine procedures. The delay caused by custom is now getting perishable goods like food into a predicament. Researchers of the London School and Economics said that because of the new tariff and increased shipping process, 6% of the cost of the food in Britain now got increased. These facts led many EU nations to issue trade with Great Britain. The trade body said that the pandemic was a huge factor, 
but the decline was largely due to the changes in the UK's trading relationships. Because of this, truck traffic from both directions from the EU states is down 29% year on year. In addition, as the complexity of additional custom checks is making many truck drivers' jobs stressful, the decreased number of drivers has been a serious problem. 40,000 drivers were working in the UK early in 2020, but the number had dropped by 15,000 in the mid-2021. Not only the truck drivers, but also 50,000 EU workers left the UK after Brexit. This has left a significant shortage in the workforce, which has put outward pressure on wages, but has also led to higher costs for businesses. Tim Martin, for instance, the founder of the Weatherspoons, the popular locals pub chain, was one of the celebrities who used to fiercely campaign for Brexit in 2004. But after being forced to close 32 branches, he is now robbing the government for more migrant workers from the EU. Not only workers, but also many large companies such as Honda, Sony, and Michelin moved to other EU countries. Direct investment in the UK from outside the EU has decreased, and the UK's economic growth rate is expected to decline in the medium to long term, meaning that the UK's role as a gateway to the EU market has ended. Moreover, there is another serious problem with Brexit. There is a conflict between the UK and Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. The issue of the UK's Northern Ireland sharing a border with the Republic of Ireland, an EU member state, is particularly complex. As part of the Brexit deal, Northern Ireland has remained in the EU single market for goods and continues to follow many EU rules. This means that there are now customs and regulatory checks on some goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. This approach has led to concern about the potential impact on trade and the peace process in Northern Ireland, which has a long history of conflict between unionist and nationalist communities. The introduction of any physical infrastructure on border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland has been strongly opposed as it could undermine the peace process. To avoid this, the UK and the EU agreed to a protocol on Northern Ireland as part of the Brexit deal. This protocol aims to ensure that there is no hard border on the island of Ireland and to protect the Good Friday Agreement, which helped bring an end to decades of violence in Northern Ireland. The protocol effectively keeps Northern Ireland in the EU custom union and a single market for goods, while regulatory checks are carried out at ports and airports instead of at the land border. However, the protocol has been controversial and has faced opposition from some unionist politicians and groups who argue that it undermines Northern Ireland's place within the UK. This approach is a de facto separation of Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK and has reignited the movement to integrate Northern Ireland into the Republic of Ireland. Okay, so while I was editing this video, Prime Minister Sunak made an agreement with the EU on the 27th February. He revised the Northern Ireland's protocol to reduce inspections and paperwork of shipping between the UK and Northern Ireland. This is, I suppose, the progress in solving the border issue between the two nations. But at the same time, the negative effect of Brexit is still lingering in Northern Ireland. Now, back to the video. The same issue now arose in Scotland as well. In the 2016 Brexit referendum, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU, with 62% of the population voting to stay. This has led to calls for a second Scottish independence referendum. As many in Scotland believe that leaving the EU against their wishes is a bleach of promise made during the 2014 Scottish independence referendum, that staying in the UK would ensure continued EU membership. The Scottish government also has proposed that, like in Northern Ireland, Scotland should be allowed to remain in the EU single market, even if the rest of the UK leaves. However, the UK government has rejected these proposals, arguing that they would undermine the integrity of the UK's internal market. This is now leading to calls for Scottish independence more than ever. Wales is also facing a similar issue. The government of both the UK and Wales agreed on a framework known as the Welsh Government's Continuity Bill in 2017, allowing Welsh government could continue to exercise powers in areas previously held by the EU, including agriculture, fisheries, research, and innovation. However, in 2018, the UK Supreme Court ruled that some parts of the Welsh Government's Continuity Bill were outside the Welsh Government's legislative body. This limited the extent to which Welsh Government could exercise powers in certain areas. The discrepancy between the UK and Wales has encouraged the Welsh independence movement in Welsh public opinion. Overall, Brexit has highlighted tensions between the UK government and the devolved nations of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. The UK government's decision to take back control of certain policy areas that were previously managed by the EU has led to concern about the future of devolution in the UK, and the balance of power between the UK government 
and devolved administrations. Brexit is a partial reversal in the globalization that dominated the last 30 years, and we're now seeing all of these symptoms emerge. In terms of economic impact, leaving the EU has already led to significant changes in trade relationships and may lead to reduced economic growth for the UK in the long term. The European Union kept prices low as a price change, having optimized and globalized, and that has started to break down over the last couple of years. As prices are getting higher and essential workers are leaving the country, many UK citizens are now struggling to spend their lives. Adding that the border issue between the UK and Northern Ireland remains a complex and sensitive matter which also highlighted tensions between Scotland and Wales against the UK. These tensions between the UK government and the devolved three countries are now a very sensitive topic. The future of the nation became very uncertain by Brexit.